Hello, Minnesota. Welcome back to the Tony Hernandez Show. I'm your host, Tony Hernandez. Today is Saturday, April 20th, 2013. Uh, we're coming to the conclusion of a very somber and sad week here in America. Uh, earlier this week was the Boston Marathon bombing. Uh, the still, the, the, there are some people in custody right now, but nobody's been formally charged or convicted of this. Uh, so that's going to be basically the topic of our show today. We're going to be talking about uh, the terrorist attack in Boston, the implications that that may have uh, for our future, and, and really terrorism in America. What, what does that mean, and, and exactly how are we going to deal with this situation? So I'm happy to say as well that although Jake was gone last week, uh, Jake Duesenberg is going to be on for the full hour today, so I'll bring him on right now. Jake? Thanks for having me back, Tony. Good to have you back, too. So uh, how's everything going? I haven't seen you for a while. Yeah, it's been about two weeks now. Um, of course, we're going to talk about how the last week's gone for me and pretty much every American here. But uh, other than that, it's been pretty pretty good. So what was your what was your first thought when you saw, heard about what happened? How did you hear about it, first of all? Well, I, I was early on in the news cycle. Uh, I, I'm pretty in touch with social media throughout the day, uh, mostly business and news-wise, especially financial news. And so it was either probably Twitter or Facebook or a um, update to my phone that would have alerted me to a bomb that uh, I think that was how initially it was reported to me. And so I tuned into, I think, Bloomberg TV, which you can stream live, and I started seeing the coverage from the get-go. And I think pretty early on, I kind of figured that this looked more like an attack as opposed to someone thought maybe a generator blown up. Mm -hmm. And so obviously with an attack, it caught my whole undivided attention for the rest of the day. Yeah, well, we're gonna we're gonna look at some of this uh, footage right now. Okay, uh, it's horrific if, as it is. Um, so we're gonna line that up and and get it going. So, for our watching, this is video that just came into us. So this is unedited video. You can see people coming across the finish line there, and there is the explosion one and two. It appears almost as in they're in different places. We'll have to figure that out as we, as we learn more about what happened here. But again, the explosion, the main one there at the Marathon Sports, and then you can hear after that, Paula, it's just absolutely heartbreaking to see this. This is video again just yeah. coming in. You see the Marathon uh, officials there reacting yeah. and getting those fences back so people can get out of the way. For instance, right here in the blue jacket, that's Tommy Marr, who every year is the person who is the official there at the finish line. You can see him running off to police off with police officers to the side to assist people. We do want to warn viewers as we take a look at this. This is raw video just coming into the newsroom, and we feel that it's important to get it out there and show it to you as quickly as possible, but we have not had a chance to edit this video yet. Lisa Hughes on the scene is describing what she describes a terrible scene. Mm -hmm. People gravely injured with missing limbs, bloody heads, and they are being <clears throat> taken to the medical tent there in Copley Square and off in ambulances at this point. But what a horrific scene. So that was, uh, that was the scene immediately when the bomb exploded at the Boston Marathon. Uh, pure chaos. Uh, I guess first I just want to make the point, number one, that this is a truly uh, sad and horrific event. And first and foremost, our prayers and our thoughts go out to the families and the families of the victims, the, the people who died in this horrific attack, the people who lost their limbs. Uh, believe me when I say that America is on your side and, and we give full sympathy in, in all our prayers uh, for those people. I think there was an eight-year-old boy that died. Uh, prayers go out to his family. And uh, just truly, truly awful. And secondly, I'd, I'd like to point out uh, the more heroic side. And I think, Jake, I saw you post something on Facebook uh, when this happened. But to point out the men and women in uniform and the people out of uniform who didn't run from the bomb but actually ran mm -hmm. to the area of impact. They, they were there wrestling with the fence, trying to clear the way, trying to get order and to save any of the people who, who might have been there. And you, you're in the Army. I mean, mm -hmm. is that your natural instinct when you see something like oh, that? Oh, absolutely. Um, you never want to be trained for an incident like an IED, an improvised explosive device, which is what was the bomb uh, that went off, just meaning it's not your typical munitions. It's something that was constructed by a, uh, you know, a regular guy um, that was aimed to produce a mass casualty. And uh, our soldiers are as well trained in that category because of what they've experienced in Afghanistan and Iraq. 
And so what I noticed, Tony, like you said, was a bunch of soldiers rushing in and doing the right thing in that incident, clearing that fence out of the way so more of the first responders could get there. And it would be surprised to find out as stories come out that some of these guys probably administered a tourniquet, which is something that I know I had been trained prior to going to Iraq about is put a tourniquet on a person that lost a limb or is bleeding profusely because we are so good at getting people to uh, a good hospital quickly that you're better off putting a tourniquet on and then uh, saving that person's life so they don't bleed to death. So, so as far as the, the updates and I haven't been paying attention to the chasing of suspects. I know that there were there was originally one uh, identified person who may or may mm -hmm. not have been a suspect. He was a, a Saudi national, a young man who was injured in the blast in the hospital. Not much was known about that situation. I know there's some controversies about that. But then the FBI came out and they named uh, two suspects from all the video footage, all the different cameras that were in mm -hmm. the particular area, they literally scoured and traced people and looked at what they were wearing and where they were at the point of the explosion. So uh, we're going to put up the two uh, pictures of uh, the, the young men who are allegedly responsible for these attacks. I believe these two gentlemen are from uh, the Russian, is it the province of Chechnya? Chechnya or are, they the, are they a sovereign nation? Yep, that's correct. And uh, so these two, and I believe these two are, are brothers. And as you can see, uh, one of them is labeled as dead. He was shot by a police officer. And then the other one uh, was being pursued for uh, quite some time. And I think they got him last night. Do you know, do you know much, much more about that? Yeah, I was stuck to the news. Um, and I was down in La Crosse, Wisconsin at, uh, I think it was at my parents' house at the time of his capture. And what ended up happening was he got outside the perimeter of uh, what the cops and the uh, uh, all the other forces that were out there, the state state cops and and I think National Guard was part of that. And he made it outside the perimeter, but just barely escaped a gunfight earlier that uh, morning. I mean, real early. I think it might have been like two or three in the morning. And he uh, got into a boat that was parked in some guy's shed. And uh, once they gave the all clear in the city, the guy left his house, get some fresh air, noticed some blood on the boat, and noticed there's a person inside. It called the cops, and then of course they went and checked out that boat. Apparently there was gunfire between the suspect and uh, FBI or police, whoever it was that went and got him, but uh, eventually he was taken alive, and now I believe he's receiving surgeries in critical condition. Mm -hmm. and one remarkable report or set of reports that came out of the Boston area is how the uh, authorities essentially initiated a, a lockdown of several suburban areas of, of Boston. People weren't allowed to leave their houses. And right. That's un unprecedented in a way, isn't it? Well, I, I think so. I mean, they're, f from what I knew at the point, and still to this, to, to this uh, hour here, that they were hunting for one man. And um, to think that you would shut down a whole city, all economic activity ceased to exist basically in this city. Uh, people were forced to stay in their homes. I don't know what I mean by forced, because mm -hmm. quite frankly, I don't know what law they would have cited. Perhaps it was a suggestion, but I believe most people followed that. And um, for one, they did that for one man. And I'm thinking, well, I, I kind of question that tactic. Uh, my first reason for that um, outside of just civil law and, uh, you know, what's proper and right in this country. But is, you know, if we're looking for this guy, don't we have a better chance of finding this guy if there are more people looking for that person as opposed to just a group of law enforcement agencies? And what ended up happening was as soon as that all clear happened, a gentleman left his house and noticed it and called the cops. Now, what would have, what would have happened if they didn't give that stay-in-your-home order and that man would have saw that five or six hours beforehand, save a lot of time and resources. So, it's an interesting point, and it yeah. you know it's a sticky subject because there are those who believe that in in dangerous situations, and y I believe you have to assume that these individuals are capable of the worst. They've already demonstrated that they're willing to target uh, young people. Uh, innocent civilians enjoying a marathon that these two individuals are potentially capable of anything. So perhaps the FBI and others need to make the assumption that they're, they're carrying a dirty bomb or they have other mm -hmm. uh, methods of, of warfare or whatnot that could be used against civilians. So as a resident of Boston, I'm, there's pl probably plenty of parents out there who appreciate 
the warning to stay inside, to stay where it's safe and, and everything. What do you, what do you think about that? If it's that? a warning, I can totally understand and appreciate it. I, I just don't know if there was some kind of legal backing to it, like it's an order. Because to me, it would be martial law for a military or police force to tell people that they cannot come outside. You have to follow a certain guidance from us. I mean, we do live in a free world. And quite frankly, if that's what we institute in our society, then I think the terrorists have achieved a greater uh, victory than anything a bomb could do. They've created a loss of liberty. And so that's what I'm a little concerned about. Now, a a if I was a Bostonian, I probably would have followed that, uh, once again, warning suggestion, whatever we mm -hmm. call it, because I probably care about the safety of my family, and I also uh, wouldn't be very successful doing anything else throughout the day because more people are going to want to be in their homes. But the other thing that came to mind was, I mean, this is hindsight. They found the, the suspect and they gave the all clear last night. But what if they didn't find that suspect last night? How much longer were they willing to take that out? I know they gave the all clear, I think about 6 p.m. Eastern. But if there was another uh, incident, you know, with this individual and, and maybe a murder of another cop or something like that, would they have given another order like they did before and told people to stay in the house? I just don't think you can go on forever doing mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then the, the flip side to this that, you know, I wanted to talk to you about is, you know, we have a principle firmly established in America, a legal principle of you're innocent until proven guilty. Mm -hmm. yep. And we also have an incredible, incredibly powerful and centralized uh, media system here in America where I was absolutely overwhelmed and shocked at how I saw uh, these individuals, and if you want to put their faces up again, how I saw these individuals on every single major news broadcast, uh, every single TV station, uh, website, right. you name it, you saw uh, faces of, of these people. And, and I believe that this is incredibly dangerous in a way. Yeah. One, it's a great law enforcement tool. Like, they'll be able to be identified. Somebody is going to see them if you, if you broadcast their faces and images enough. Right. Somebody is going to recognize who they are. Uh, the dangerous side of it is with very little uh, evidence or trial or, or solid witnesses that have given a credible testimony mm -hmm. on the record, um, the general assumption of the public is that these two individuals are the ones responsible for this attack, it bypasses in a way their, their due process because you already have this overwhelming sentiment that they are guilty right. without being charged, without a jury. And can, can you talk a little more about that? Yeah, that's a slippery slope. I, I usually opt on the sides of liberty, or not usually, I always do. But in this case, if they are an immediate threat to the United States, to the people of Boston, Watertown, the areas around that, um, there, I don't see too many problems with the presumption of, of guilt in that case because of public safety. If people take up arms uh, against the United States or to our citizens, then it's not about, you know, um, talking about the Miranda rights or whatnot. It's about the safety of the public. I think it changes once that person has been captured. And from my understanding, this person hasn't been read his Miranda rights which is something that's given to each person that's arrested in the United States because we have a presumption of innocence until proven guilty. And, and that's where I would probably get a little bit more concerned. But the media's and most people's uh, uh, label of this guy being a bad person or dangerous or even guilty, the cause of the, the bombings, I guess I just go with what law enforcement's telling us in Boston because they probably have a better chance of telling what that threat is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, are you worried at all that there might be more people that were involved or do you think that this is a it was just these two i you know one of the criticisms i have tony with the media this whole week is that everyone has got a speculation everyone wants their their fame hour and whatnot and i guess we've got here another 40 minutes or 45 minutes so we can we can try to make our own guesses too mm -hmm. and speculation i really don't i i i it really, I mean, I, I don't have the evidence. I know there are conspiracy theories out there. I'm not talking to anyone on the ground, really, other than two friends that were in a marathon, and that was mostly just to see their safety. So I, I, can't, I can't even speak to it. I don't think it's something orchestrated from overseas, but I don't know. Um, to a certain point, we're kind of relying on 
the government, and I hate to say that because I am a, uh, you know, a very libertarian-minded individual, but at a certain point you have to rely on the people to have the resources to actually discover this, unless you're a first-hand witness of what's going on or you're uh, somewhat related or friends of the family members. And I know they had interviewed both uh, the father in Chechnya and then the uh, uh, aunt that's in Canada. Mm -hmm. Actually, pretty hilarious uh, press conference with the aunt. Um, but, uh, you know, they, they presume that they were innocent and they're being framed. Um, the uncle in town, I think, assumed he was guilty. Um, and one the uncle complete. who lives in Chechnya? Chechnya? No, the uncle that's actually here okay. uh, it was in Boston. I, I don't know if they interviewed anyone else in Chechnya other than the father. And so, um, yeah, I mean, these mm. people would know better. But, I mean, even then, they, there might be a disconnect. So let the evidence come forward, show their guilt, if you will, and then let them be prosecuted the way that any other criminal would be prosecuted. I now, I know, yeah, and I know people will, will say, well, okay, listen, these people might be a danger to the United States, and if there's connections, we need to figure that out. But at the same point, once again, if one of the goals of terrorism is to undermine the rule of law in the United States, undermine liberty, well, then another victory is given to the terrorists for not giving this guy his Miranda rights. Mm -hmm. and, and the point of terror, terror in a way is, is unfounded fear. You know, for instance, Leona and I had a big old mouse in our house the other day. <laughs> and both her and I were screaming like young children from this little mouse that we knew ultimately would not be able to hide us, hurt us whatsoever. Uh, in a way, terrorism is that same way. Yeah. I mean, horrific acts at the Boston Marathon. Absolutely horrific. If you break it down in the numbers, though, you are much more likely to die from a heart attack at a marathon than you are from some yep. evildoer putting uh, some random homemade bomb in a bag and putting it by a stop sign or something like right. that. And I believe as Americans, we need to keep these events into perspective. And, and as you say, we shouldn't allow them to dominate our lives. We shouldn't allow fear to control us or to control our emotions or our behaviors or our decisions. And I believe that by keeping these things into uh, perspective that uh, we are able to, uh, to do that. So... Yeah. Uh, with that, uh, I'm going to bring on uh, Sam Pierce. Uh, Sam, can you hear us? I can. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. I'm going to turn down the volume a little bit. So, have you been uh, paying attention to, to what we've been uh, talking about here, Sam? I have. I've, I've been here the whole time and, and listening intently. So, uh, we, I mean, we were talking about both of us, uh, how we love marathons and how great of a sport running is and everything. So, can you talk a little more about just the... Uh, how ironic that is, and, and your thoughts about that? It is ironic and uh, and sad at the same time because we were talking about what a wonderful process it is last week and how you challenge yourself and what you learn about yourself. And a marathon is unlike other sporting events, my opinion, in that you don't have a winner and a loser like a game. You don't have a winner and a number of losers like a tournament. There's a winner and they are incredible athletes. But here, Tony, someone like you or I, we were talking about our respective marathons last, last week on the show. We can be out there sharing the course with those elite athletes, and, and we're finishing and completing this journey ourselves, and it's a celebration of, of our own accomplishment. Uh, we're not losers to, to the winner of the marathon. Uh, every, it, it, and at the risk of sounding... <laughs> at the risk of, of sounding a little cliche, everybody wins that day. And there are families and friends that come out to celebrate that. And Boston is, is the preeminent example, not just in the country, but, but in the world. So while I agree with everything you and Jake said that we can't let terror consume us, I do think that we have to... Um, be aware of the fact that, that this evil exists, that someone targeted a day called Patriot's Day in Boston, Massachusetts, and targeted uh, just regular civilians that, that are having a celebratory day and an event. Someone did a lot of homework, <laughs> a lot of research, and said, how can we, how can we inflict terror 
on the most innocent people that, that should be participating and celebrating something that they should cherish for the mm-hmm. rest of their lives. Um, and, and for me personally, a, a quick story, uh, when I was watching the, the replay footage over and over again, as I'm sure you and a lot of your viewers did, and I was watching the, the explosions go off at about 408, 409. And Tony, I finished my marathon uh, about 401. I think you were in the 420s. Uh, I wish. Pretty- I was a little higher than <laughs> Okay. But, but the, 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 the point is... I cramped uh, up. No, just... We're, we're, <laughs> well, we're pretty average runners, right? Right. Uh, we're, we're kids that grew up playing sports and, and considered ourselves athletic, and we said we're going to run a marathon. But by marathon standards, we're pretty average. So we're coming in in that four, five-hour uh, time frame to finish, and that's when they detonated. They didn't go after the world-class runners. They said, let's, let's get the average guy or girl and their families that are watching. Let's, let's strike right then and there. Um, and I could be looking into it too much. Maybe it was just random, but well, wait, what do you think? Uh, what do you think, yeah, Jake? I, I mean, I, is Sam onto something there? I, do you I, think this was yeah. targeted? I kind of come to that same conclusion there as well. Uh, you know, being that it was around that four-hour mark, I remember training for a marathon about a year ago, and uh, that was, you know, I'm I'm just like you, gentlemen. I'm not a, uh, a supreme running athlete. Um, you know, I was a football player, so my build is more. We have geared, the same build. <laughs> yeah, ge- ge- geared towards maybe shorter distances. So a right. marathon to me, a good time is that four-hour mark. And I know there are a lot of people that run those marathons or just in our class that, you know, think think a two, two-hour half marathon time is right on pace where they want to be. And, you know, just on top of that, to make, a, make the situation a little lighter, you know how I can tell I'm not a real runner, Sam? It's because when I went to the when Leona and I went to the running store to get running shorts, I wanted the longest absolute pair of running shorts that they had. <laughs> and I think the higher your shorts are, that the more real of a, a or professional of a runner. Do you think there's truth to that, Tony? I, I still I still wear basketball shorts for all my <laughs> all my training and all my races. And and like like you and Jake, I, I grew up with football and, and basketball, and that's why for me to get down around the four hour time frame absolutely i I considered that an accomplishment um so i i was just you know i'm I'm mostly saddened at the loss of life stories of amputations but they just really uh you know it it just got to me as i as i like i said when i looked at that time frame and where they chose to detonate and who they went after and it's terrible to go after anyone but um that being said, I, I wanted, before I forget, I wanted to make a, a quick uh, comment on something you and Jake had mentioned earlier when you were talking about the, the way that our medical and police and fire responders oh, yeah. uh, react, and they do such a great job, and, and it's heroic. There, there's no other word for it. Um, I don't want to say it's a silver lining because there is no silver lining, but in addition to just... Uh, what they're thinking about is saving lives at that point, but I I like that it brings out the best in us. That's right. Their their response is immediate victory over the terrorism. Yep. It, in the way they contain and combat <laughs> the evil immediately. Right. And uh, and I, so I just I just wanted to follow up. With and that. and they they did they saved lives. Uh, just knowing my basic first aid in, in incidents like that, an IED explosion, you know, it could be down to minutes and seconds where someone has to apply a tourniquet and evacuate them right away from that area in order for that life to be saved. Um, otherwise, you know, they'll bleed to death. And I actually saw a photo of an individual, and since um, the, two, the three people dead so far is an eight-year-old child and two females, uh, so I would, the presumption here is this person is going to survive um, and it was a male, and he had lost both legs, and he was being evacuated in a wheelchair from the scene, which is just fantastic that they were able to do that and get that guy out. I mean, two legs lost, probably got to the hospital within about 15 minutes from that. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, one, one, one thing I would, wanted to talk to, too, is the, the nature of terrorism. You know, we have this perception that terrorism is this, these foreigners that mm-hmm. are trying to come and kill Americans because they hate our freedom. Uh, It struck me, 
with these incidents of terrorism is how much cowardice is behind these acts. The act or the planning and plotting of killing innocent people, regardless of their age, yeah. regardless of their identity, what they've ever done, just simply innocent bystanders, I believe, is, is the ultimate cowardice. And, and it's really no different than the cowardice that the uh, shooter in Sandy Hook, the right. Newtown shootings, complete cowardice to go into an elementary school and to kill and shoot yeah. young children, right. or the cowardice of the Aurora shooter who went into the movie theaters and just started to, to gun down and kill people that are watching a movie, right. uh, defenseless. And I think it's, it's very important and pertinent to uh, look at the targets of these acts of terrorism, and they are going after people who cannot defend themselves, nor are they prepared to defend themselves. Right. And, you know, we hear all this talk about the anti-gun legislation and gun restrictions and everything. And, well, not to make this a political issue, but the terrorist in, at the Boston Marathon did not use a gun. They, right. He used or they used homegrown products. Right. Can you talk a little more about that, Jake? Sure. W could that have been prevented if more people were, were on guard or, or armed right. at that point? I can, I can understand your reluctance to get into politics on tragedies, um, and I am the same way. A lot of people get to social media right off the bat, and they'll want to talk about that. And I, I generally stray away from it uh, during the grieving period, and maybe that's very illy defined. Uh, but um, one thing that stood out to me to bring politics in this equation is we had a concerted effort at both the federal level and not knowing Massachusetts, I'm going to assume in that state there was a state level as well, uh, following the tragedy of Sandy Hook to further restrict law-abiding gun owners, their rights to uh, defend themselves via a gun. And um, I'm thinking, you know, in that particular instance on Friday where we have a person at large uh, willing to wreak havoc on the public, uh, armed and dangerous, I can't imagine you would want to not have a firearm uh, capable of getting rid of that threat and protecting your family. And that, you know, seven round magazine, a 10 round magazine, you know, I don't want anyone to find that for me at that point. And Sam, uh, Sam, you and I, we were around 22 or 23 around the time of the September 11th attacks. Uh, were you, I think you were still in Madison when that occurred. Uh, did this bring up any uh, old memories of that, or do you see any consistencies in terms of that? Well, uh, I'll, let me, uh, I'll try. <laughs> um, one thing that, that comes to mind for me, Tony, is that Boston, like September 11th, and, uh, and I think like Oklahoma City way back in the, in the mid-90s, are examples of terror that is inflicted and it doesn't take a gun. Right. So I hope that, so one of the things that comes to mind for me is, is that in the wake of all of this, I hope that there are some discussions about what is bringing about this evil, even if it's homegrown, because now we're, we're talking about people that, that their family got asylum here and they were afforded the, I would say opportunities to grow up in America. Just to clarify, who who are you talking about, Sam? Are you talking oh, about? Oh, I'm the, sorry. The, let me. Uh, the, the, so the boss, so the suspects. Um, yeah. These these are people that came here and uh, and got that their family was given asylum to come here from Chechnya. So what what strikes me is that uh, a they didn't need a gun. So uh, <laughs> so I hope that just constant legislation isn't the only discussion by our by our leaders um and b there are there are there are far greater problems uh why we have this this vitriol and this constant it seems at this point constant need to to inflict <laughs> violence coming from whether it's whether it's sandy hook with a gun or, or boston without one um you know what's going on because these these people have these, these suspects in Boston have been here for for many years, and like I said, they were afforded the opportunities to live here. And I and I I read and heard for many years following September 11th, Tony, to go back to your to your question about September 11th, that 
well, if people have the chance to live in America and not uh, these third world countries in the Middle East where they don't have opportunities and that's why they become radicalized because of course you sign up for Al-Qaeda. These, these young men had all those opportunities. They were here. Their family was given asylum and yet somehow now we're dealing with homegrown terrorism, um, some sort of violent culture that exists that leads to things like Sandy Hook and whether it's guns or explosives, we have work to do, I think, in this country to get to the bottom of that. And I don't think that immediate legislation is the answer. Let me comment on that. I understand. I agree with Sam's final statement there. Um, there's this jump to conclusion that this is terrorism, all right? And uh, it's to the discredit of the media. I remember the first press conference by Obama. Well, why didn't he mention it was terrorism, right? Terrorism actually has a definition, and it means there's some kind of political objective, right? At this point, I'm not sure we actually know what that is, which would be the motive of uh, committing this crime. So at this point, these two suspects would be alleged criminals. Um, when we start talking about violence, I don't think of any period in human history that isn't violent. So I don't necessarily think this is something new that we have to deal with. It's kind of like these bullying laws. It's not like bullying all just all of a sudden came out of nowhere. We're just using this as some kind of political agenda. Uh, there's always been bullying. Well, that's the same thing with violence. I mean, throughout Mer throughout U.S. history and, and world history, we've had violence. It's just human nature. The important part is if under their investigation they find out that these men were a radicalized jihadist, and that uh, has some sort of threat to the United States safety, then I think we have some political uh, issue that needs to be addressed and something that needs to happen out of Washington, D.C. Otherwise, uh, I'm not quite sure we can solve the issue of violence. I think if we're trying to solve that, we're going to fall flat on our face. Well, Sam, can you respond to that? Is what the alleged act from the alleged suspects, is it terrorism? Um. But uh, Jake makes all good points. Uh, I've, I've just I've read quite a bit that the investigation so far has revealed that 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 both of the brothers and certainly the older one uh, had, had a he had a YouTube channel uh, that had a lot of postings about jihad and or favorable commentary on his part about other jihadist videos. Uh, and activities now. Yeah, his Twitter that, account, that be, his Twitter account would be inconsistent of that, though. Okay, so so there's more, so there's more to learn. It right. sounds like that's and, that's why I'm reluctant, Sam. I tend to okay. I tend to let the facts come forward before people start uh, making their assumptions. Like I said, it's probably good we don't just spend this hour making sure. our guess and where this thing goes, because quite frankly, we for, found out the day one there was a Saudi national supposedly. Uh, that they were look, trying to investigate. You know, we found out there was two extra bombs that were dis, uh, detonated by the police on the first day, and then we heard there was a bomb at the JFK library. In this sure. instance of chaos, there is a lot of chaos, right? I mean, in this uh, tragedy, there's a lot of chaos. And from my experience serving overseas in multiple theaters, that's what happens with any kind of tragedy. There's a lot of chaos and a lot of misinformation that goes around. So I'm a little reluctant to start speculating, and I think that's to discredit the media trying to pin Obama on terrorism. Now, was it terror? Of course it was terror, obviously. But what's really important for us going forward politically is does this create a threat? Is this something that we need to worry about in the future of more attacks? And actually it doesn't even have to come from overseas if it's a domestic issue. Uh, you know, a Timothy McVeigh that might have intentions of blowing up other federal buildings. Same thing if these guys have other intentions of sporting uh, events and stuff like that. But, you know, otherwise, if we're just trying to get rid of violence, it's like saying, let's get rid of war. I mean, it's part of human nature. Um, what we want to do is make sure we protect our citizens uh, if, if there's an immediate threat. Mm -hmm. And so what would you say, what do you guys say to uh, the people who say, you know, say for instance that this is an act of terror and it was used, directed against the American way or the American political system. Uh, what do you say to those people who say that 
this is blowback or these are the consequences of what America deserves because of failed foreign policy and because of drone strikes that are occurring overseas and because of a couple of the wars that we've engaged in over the last 12 years. Uh, is there any merit to people who are saying that terrorism is, is blowback or America deserves what it gets in terms of these terrorist attacks? Well, you'll never hear me say that America deserves what it gets because I think that's wrong. I don't think we vote for legislators that always serve us the best with the best intentions, meaning I think 80% of the public was against uh, the t TARP bailouts, uh, 60 to 70% right. were against Obamacare, and legislators go against the will of the American people. Well, they do this even more so with foreign policy. So if anything, maybe it's a result or a blowback of what they're doing. Um, and that's hard to tell in this particular case. I will say that there's no doubt that blowback is true. Uh, you know, we intervene in nations. We come to the aid of Israel. We try to depose of rulers. Uh, Iran comes to mind, uh, and, and we in institute the Shah. Um, you know, there, there are just so many cases where I think there's blowback, but we don't know in this case yet. Yeah. Well, you know, I'll give another example too, Sam, and maybe you can uh, hone in on this. Right around the time of the Boston Marathon uh, explosion, the bomb that went off, uh, there was a, another article that popped up uh, from uh, overseas, and it was an activity that took place in Afghanistan, and, and I'll do some more research to find out the exact uh, day and time and everything, but generally speaking, it was right around the same time as the Boston Marathon bombing. And what happened was uh, we had sent out a, a drone strike um, to, to come and to bomb mm -hmm. some particular targets. And I don't know if it was a drone or actually a, an Air Force strike, um, but essentially what happened is the bomb went off target, it went into a, a wedding and, in an Afghani village, and essentially uh, 30 people who were attending this wedding mm -hmm. died due to this errant bomb uh, that went off and, and, and killed these people. And they're Afghanis, and of course we've been at war in Afghanistan since 2001 uh, or two. And so you don't hear so much about, about this activities and whatnot, but you know, 30 people dying versus what happened in Boston, are, are these two incidents, uh, should we have the same amount of outrage for them? Sam, what do you think? Um, well, first we'd be on a, a real hypothetical wing to say that that, that they were related I, I, don't, I don't think you were no I'm not saying that they were directly I'm not saying they were directly related at all what I'm saying right. is is that we have drone strikes and air force strikes in other countries uh, that I, we okay. that we use that you know not on purpose but they end up bombing uh, innocent people and they mm -hmm. die in this instance right around the same time uh, there was an Afghani wedding that was bombed and 30 people who were attending this wedding uh, ended up dying uh, due to this. And if you think about it, going to a wedding uh, is a very, like probably the w most joyous occasion that friends and family do together. And uh, in the same way, there's some parallels to what happened at the Boston Marathon. I mean, a marathon is a very positive thing. Mm -hmm. As Sam was saying, people who run marathons are uh, incredible athletes and their friends and their family. Uh, really celebrate that, and wedding is the same way. And, and so what I'm saying is, is, is the media hypocritical in terms of all these eyes that are, ha what happened at the Boston Marathon and, and turning a blind eye to what happens overseas? Sam? So, so uh, I, I think, okay, so as far as the media and some hypocrisy, which is uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not always, uh, that that's, tends to be their, the norm for them sometimes, but I actually think the media has done, they give, this is my opinion, not, not that of the Tony Hernandez show necessarily, but I think they give President Obama a free pass on a lot. I actually would go as far as to say that with the drone strikes, they've pushed back a little. Um, in, in the last year, I've read a lot more in, in major newspapers to say, wait a second, is, is this okay? And, and what about civil, civilian casualties? I... Uh, so, so I don't think in that regard that the media has been too hypocritical. If you're saying that there should be more coverage drawn to American mishaps overseas that lead to civilian death, then, then there might be a case for that. I, when you were talking to Jake about 
retribution or, or reprisal? That, that does America have these things coming to it? I would agree with Jake. Absolutely not. But I would also, I recall right away in the Republican primaries, Tony, and you'll probably recall this too, in uh, 2011, prior to the election, and they're getting on foreign policy, and I forget which exact debate this was, but it was when there were still seven or eight Republicans running for the nomination, and and they were talking about nuclear weapons in the Middle East, and Iran, and Pakistan, and everyone gave a really long-winded answer, and finally Ron Paul said, I think we ought to mind our own damn business. <laughs> yeah, I absolutely, he said, I absolutely think that they have anti-American views because of our involvement overseas. And and then if there are drone strikes or other military endeavors that lead to civilian casualties, then yeah, if, if you're growing up there, if you're, if you're a young you know, 20 year old man in, in one of these countries, I, I can see the vitriol and the and the and the, the dislike or hate to the extreme of America may be perpetuating. Do you yeah. see that? Jay? Well, and and I agree with Sam. Uh, I agreed with Ron Paul on that. I've seen that, experienced that, but uh, I'm not. I think this is speculation. If we want to go further on the subject, being that we're getting there from this recent bombing with right. Two suspects that happen to be of Chechen, Chechnyan descent, and actually, I think, basically, have been in America the majority of their lives. I've been in a Muslim country uh, in Kosovo, uh, which was which declared its independence from Serbia, which was a Orthodox Eastern Orthodox Christian nation, and we sided uh, more on the recent side with the Albanian uh, Muslims. And so I wouldn't see as many backlash uh, or jihadist uh, movements inside of that group of Albanian Muslims. In fact, if anything, they'd be more pro-American. So as far as this case is concerned, I'm not sure it's there, uh, but I'm not an expert on Chechnya. So we'll see. But at this point, all speculation. In the broader scheme, yes, absolutely, there is blowback. We've seen it. Uh, I mean, we have been... Uh, intervening in many different conflicts around the world for many decades, and there's obviously results to that, or mm. consequences to that. Well, Sam Wayne Pierce, uh, thank you for uh, coming on the show again. I uh, appreciate having you here, broadcasting from Syracuse, New York. Thanks for your insight and your input, and uh, hopefully we will be seeing you next week. Okay, sounds good, Tony. See you later, Sam. Take care, Sam. So, Jake, uh, we're going we're gonna to shift uh, topics a sure. bit, uh, try to lighten things up a little bit okay. here. <laughs> Talk about some good old federal economics, even though I don't think Oh, you want to lighten up the subject. Okay. <laughs> That's yeah. what I was thinking. Well, <laughs> anything compared to what happened in Boston is, is light com compared to the topics sure. of terrorism and killing and bombing and everything like that. So, um, But there was some recent news. Gold which you've been very bull or, uh, bearish on gold. No, bullish. Bullish. What's the <laughs> difference? Uh, it's bull believes in the price going up, bear price going down. The way I like to explain it is uh, you think about the way those two animals attack. This is how you always remember it. A bull will attack from a low position and move up with its horns, so it's pushing up, whereas a bear will be up on its hind legs and tacking down, uh, and that's where you get the term bear. So uh, I've been bullish on gold for quite some point, and Monday was a very interesting day because gold was taking... A, quite a big correction. I believe it ended up at 9%. And I had been following that, talking to clients all day, release commentary, and lo and behold, in the afternoon, we see what happened with uh, the Boston Marathon. So it was a very interesting day. Hmm. So you think gold's going to keep going up then? You think this is actually a great time to buy? I think it's a discount price. Uh, it's very difficult to always assume I know what the re real price, the true market price is of gold. But I do understand the fundamentals of gold, and it's still there. Uh, so w what I like to do is explain why I like gold as an asset class and then show you where the fundamentals are. And I brought in charts of Dell's could show that when I talk about gold, I talk about it as money. And that sounds crazy because we don't generally think of gold as money. I don't think of it as an investment. It doesn't pay you dividends. It doesn't grow in nature of, uh, you know, uh, of a balance sheet, you know, one year you own this X amount of widgets and the next year you own X plus two amount of widgets. It's gold. What it is, it's money. It's a commodity. It can be used in exchange. 
and it possesses value. That's the definition of money. So in the next slide, let's take a look at money, uh, a, a gold versus what we use in the United States economy, U.S. dollars. Gold is valued because of its beauty and its use in jewelry. Now, when you proposed to Leona, I'm guessing she would have slapped you in the face if you put a ring on her finger that didn't have a little gold on it, right? <laughs> Even if it was white gold. And that's generally what has happened for thousands of years. If we go into an old pyramid in, e pyramid in Egypt, you'll probably find gold somewhere in that buried treasure. If you go down to the depths of uh, the sea where a ship is, you know, a Spanish ship, you probably find gold on there. So it's been valued for, for th thousands of years. Unlike U.S. dollars, if you just take a pure physical paper dollar, it has no value other than what you can use to burn, right? So fuel. So uh, dollars essentially uh, have no value except for what law does. And law comes in and says this can be used in all debts, public and private, and we call it legal tender law. So that's where the value of our U.S. dollar comes from. The other thing that's interesting is knowing that uh, money is a commodity, gold's supply is relatively stable. You have to dig it out of the earth or you have to dig it out of the sea. Either way, its supply is relatively stable as opposed to other commodities like corn. You could have one bad growing season and all of a sudden corn is scarce and the price goes up. Oil, you could have a, 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 a oil rig go down and all of a sudden the, the oil supply is scarce or you have a couple more oil rigs go up something like like what's happening in North Dakota and the su supply has gone up and then therefore the price has gone down. The US dollar is a little different here. Supply has increased or decreased um, actually digitally nowadays but even if it was in the sense that you have to go through a printing press with paper with so many trees that there's really not a scarce it's not really a scarce resource. Um, so it's easily increased its supply. So that's the other uh, important difference between gold as money and U.S. dollars as money. So now knowing that, if we go to this next slide here, we see that a dollar or a currency that's not backed by a physical metal or a physical commodity is called fiat money. And that's not just the U.S. dollar. It's also the euro, it's the yen, and the pound. So it's very important here. When we look at what the central banks that issue each one of these currencies has done in the last decade or so, we can start to understand why prices in the economy, especially in gold and other commodities, have gone up. So if you go to this next chart, I'm going to show you, uh, courtesy of uh, Double Line uh, Capital uh, and Bloomberg, I'm showing you right here the balance sheets of the major banks on top here is the euro, the ECB, the European Central Bank. It's in green. And that's had an incredible increase in the last decade. And right below that in purple is our own Federal Reserve, which issues our currency. And you can see a huge spike following the mortgage crisis. And then also the other major banks here following suit. In Japanese, you even see a spike post the uh, hurricane, uh, or I'm sorry, the uh, earthquake and tsunami event. So this, uh, can you explain this graph a little more sure. then? This is, this is basically the number of dollars or euros or yen or pounds that are out there in circulation, in securities, in, in mortgages or? Not, not quite, but it, it, it would look fairly similar. What I'm showing here on this chart is the balance sheet, okay? of the central banks. Mm -hmm. So you'll see the, in the purple is the Federal Reserve and it's shown a balance sheet of uh, $3 trillion. Mm -hmm. That means the assets they have. Now the Fed didn't all of a sudden come across, um, you know, if you look here since January 2008, uh, where they were under a trillion. It's not like they came across $2 trillion in new assets. What they did is they create new credit or new money mm -hmm. and then they buy assets with that. So in fact, what these banks are doing is they're creating inflation. A more accurate measure of what you're talking about is the monetary base. So if we go to this next slide, I actually show that, which you'll see it's a normal, a similar trend. And here in particular in the United States, when I compare the price of gold since 1986 to the monetary base, which is all the money in circulation in the U.S. economy, you can see that as an increase or decrease percentage per year, that gold has actually underperformed the monetary base. I guess I shouldn't say underperform, is it's not a price that we're talking about, but the 
the price increase does not quite keep pace with increase in the supply of money in the economy. And that's a further explanation of how inflation works. But generally speaking, as you can see, and this is my argument here, as the monetary base increases, so the amount of money in circulation increases, so does the price of gold. And in particular, why people talk about gold's on a bull run in that, or it's a bubble uh, state, because they look at this chart here and they see in those last couple years, or last uh, six years, gold has increased an incredible amount. But what has also increased during that point is our monetary base, our amount of money in our economy. And so I actually think that the more money there is in an economy, the less value each currency unit, therefore the price of gold and other commodities will continue to increase. So until I see a reverse of monetary policy, I will remain bullish on uh, diversifying into the gold. Can, and I, I need some further explanation because okay. when I'm looking at these these two graphs that are here, the gold price versus monetary expansion and then the amount of the balance sheets in, in the previous one, sure. if you look at both, what I find alarming is you see in the purple line, that's the Federal Reserve uh, balance sheet. And from 1995 to 2008, that's a fairly steady and res responsible curve. Yeah, you know, fairly conservative not, bank is what they call it. There, there's not much change. It's, it is slightly going up, you know, probably hitting that target inflation rate. But then you hit the 2008 and it spikes up dramatically. And you look at the gold price, it's the same thing. Uh, what, what is driving that? It's, it's a shift in philosophy. Well, I, even that might not be the correct way to put it. Uh, I think the philosophy has been there. It's called Keynesianism, where a government or a central bank needs to step in and stimulate an economy during a bus cycle. Um, what I think it is is a difference in active, uh, activity, where our central bank has completely lost any conservative, steady increase in the monetary supply and used the bank's printing press in order to try to save the economy to stimulate it, partly because the federal government is incapable of doing it with their large budget deficits. In fact, a lot of what this money is buying are fe are, is our federal debt. It's buying U.S. Treasuries. Mm -hmm. I remember in, in 2008, uh, during the rush of the, the financial collapse and even the, couple, the year before that, mm -hmm. 2007, when the subprime mortgage crisis hit, I'm in the mortgage profession. And I remember thinking at the time that of the of the crisis that there was going to be no way for real estate to be able to survive this and i and right. i said the only way because at that point we were already at historic mortgage interest rate lows right i mean the 30-year fixed rate was you know five percent maybe kind of at, a, at its lowest level right uh and since then the, the way that the federal reserve has responded to the crisis is upping the ante getting the interest rates even lower, creating another refinance boom where people are going from those 5.5% rates and they're now refinancing to 3.5% or 3.25 right. on a 30-year fixed rate. And I, uh, can you explain a little more? Because it seems to be in my, in my mind, and I can't really verbalize it too well, but there seems to be a relation between uh, going from historic lo low interest rates to even historically lower interest rates and, and to what I'm seeing on this graph here. Interest rates are a price. Uh, in general speaking, in America, we don't do price setting. Uh, we do it in minimum wage laws because it's a labor price. Um, health insurance. We do in health degree. insurance now. I think Obamacare will fix some of that uh, or uh, further that program, I should mm -hmm. say. But a lot of our experiences, experiences in the past, in particular the Great Depression era, is when we kind of abandon the idea of uh, price fixing. We have not abandoned that when it comes to interest rates. It's very important to understand this. Interest rate is a price. The amount of money, or the, it's the price of what a saver is willing to lend their money to a borrower, okay? And now in any market, uh, you know, if there's a greater amount, a supply of money to lend out, as opposed to a smaller demand for it, the supply will bring, or the large supply and low demand will bring prices down, so interest rates would be low. Well, since we don't have the highest amount of savings ever in the United States, the Fed has to come in and create credit or create uh, capital, as they would call it, and therefore give the impression that there's a large amount of savings. The problem is that capital that they've created is actually not real savings, it's inflation. 
And so that's where you would see that. And the only way they could get away with doing this is by creating credit, uh, basically out of thin air. And it's interesting that you say that because when I first started in the mortgage business back in 2002, uh, we had so many different lenders and types of lenders mm -hmm. that you could choose from, from the prime uh, mortgage, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, then you had uh, A+, plus, you had A-, minus, Alt-A, lending, uh, and, and there was just a, a plethora of different lenders, and you right. really had this feeling that the, there was a market at work here, that right. these lenders were working, uh, not only competing with each other, but also servicing the borrower and finding the different niche borrowers. That essentially, <laughs> that lending model is essentially dead now. Right. Um, the, the loans that go through are either government loans or they're Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac mortgages, and the guidelines are essentially the same. You right. need full tax returns from everybody. You need uh, income documentation from ev everybody and, and, and full credit checks and, and things of that sort. So are you telling me then that the, the net result of the Fed policy is basically created just one bank that funds this entire pool of mortgages that are out there and, well, the and they're bought and sold by different the investors Fed, then? Yeah, the Fed actually, um, the Fed is made up of several, I think thousands of banks, hundreds at least, uh, that are members of the Federal Reserve. Any federally chartered bank is a member of the Federal Reserve. Of that, the mass amount of capital and wealth in the economy is held at the top banks. Uh, I mean, it's astronomical how much bigger of asset, uh, amount of assets they have than your, <coughs> your average bank here. Uh, for instance, we'll just use Bremer for uh, the point of my, my, uh, what I'm trying to make here. Uh, in, in, in the cities. So, um, so yes, a consolidation of that. And that all was a result of TARP when some of those banks that would have gone bust naturally were bailed out by the federal government and have been kept afloat through the, uh, the discount window at the Federal Reserve. So, um, yes, that and Fannie, Fannie and Freddie's operation has continued with great success as long as the Fed continues to create this credit and allow the, the Fannie and Freddie to uh, sell them their mortgage-backed securities. Mm -hmm. And I essentially think the plan might be is to continue this operation until That's Freddie and, and Fannie can be an independent pseudo-government agency once again. You know, and, and Tony, the, the, the interesting thing about this is there's no exit strategy for the Fed. It's probably the most important thing you could Google because it doesn't really exist. There's speculation, but with all these assets the Fed has bought, and as you've seen that chart, it's not just the Fed, it's also the European Central Bank and and the Japanese banks, but what is the exit strategy? How do we get out of all of this money that they've created? Uh, can they, and if they don't, at some point we'll start seeing consumer prices in totality uh, grow to a price or to a point that we can't really handle as a mm -hmm. consumer. And finally, do you, so you're saying you don't see any of this scaled back. Do you see the Federal Reserve raising interest rates anytime soon? No, I don't. They've uh, kept the uh, Fed funds rate at 25 basis points. They said they've extended that through 2015 and they've continued the QE programs, both three, which is mortgage backed securities, and QE4, which is the treasury market. And by the way, just understanding how incompetent Washington, D.C. is at ever coming close to balancing a budget, they need the Fed to buy those, uh, those treasuries. Otherwise, their uh, borrowing costs are going to grow so quickly that they wouldn't be able to handle it. Which is probably we'll never see a, a balanced budget in the federal government for quite it's, some time. It's very sad. I mean, you and Leona have to do it. Chris and I have to do it. But apparently uh, they don't. They have a bank that will bail them out. Well, Jake, that's about all our time here. Thanks, Thanks again for coming on. And thank you for tuning in. This is the Tony Hernandez Show. We broadcast live every Saturday from 4 o'clock to 5 o'clock on SCC Television Studios in White Bear Lake. May God bless your week, may God bless America, and vaya con Dios.